Hello everyone, my name is Tony Gallagher and I'm a professor of education at Queen's. A couple of weeks ago I appeared on the local BBC News talking about education problems arising from the lockdown. When one of my grand granddaughters saw me on the TV she walked up to the TV and asked me a question and she was mightily confused when I didn't answer. It turned out she got so used to talking to me via Zoom uh, during the lockdown that she thought I was on Zoom again. It was a reminder, I suppose, of just how much has changed in such a short period of time and of how quickly we've adapted to it. And in the few minutes we have together, that's really what I want us all to think about. What has changed in this crisis? But more important, once we get through it, what should change? We know that a lot of things have changed in education. Teachers putting in place arrangements for remote learning almost overnight. Schools printing learning packs and finding ways to distribute these to pupils. The cancellation of public examinations and new arrangements being put in place for teachers to predict grades using existing information. A lot has changed for families as well. Over a quarter of workers have been furloughed from their jobs. Many more are working doing their jobs remotely while juggling childcare responsibilities. Uh, and many have lost their jobs altogether. In an extraordinarily short period of time, our world has literally turned upside down. But we've seen some wonderful things happening in this period as well. There's a wonderful spread of social solidarity as people look out for their elderly or sick neighbours, helping them with shopping or, as we say in Northern Ireland, getting their messages. Tens of thousands of people have stepped up as volunteers in all sorts of different roles. And the National Treasure, otherwise known as the NHS, has really come into its own. We've also come to appreciate what we mean by an essential worker from the doctors and nurses in the front lines of our hospitals, to the porters and cleaners and administrators and social workers and care workers who have thrown a wider circle of care around those who are ill and their families, to the farm workers and truck drivers and delivery drivers and supermarket checkout staff who are keeping our food supplies moving. But I was very struck one morning when I heard Padre Gotuma on the BBC when he said that lockdown had proved to be a revelation. But not, he said, because it had shown us something new, but because it had revealed something to us that had been there all along. And what it had revealed to us was the depth of inequality that continues to poison our society and the limitations in our ability to tackle it. There's now plenty of evidence emerging that the education achievement gap between the affluent and the disadvantaged is getting wider by the day. Surveys have identified a pattern of differential access uh, for and support with children and young people from poor households losing out. In a survey carried out uh, by Maynooth University into primary schools, one teacher graphically put it like this uh, when she said, about a third of parents will ensure the prescribed work is done, another third will be overwhelmed and unable to engage with distance learning, and another third will just not bother. And day by day, our understanding of the scale of the problem grows. Special arrangements in England to support children entitled to free school meals uh, only partially worked at the start and weeks into lockdown 30% were still not receiving a substitute. We're hearing more and more concern on mental health and stress effects from families being cooped up together. And there are growing concerns about the longer term impact of adverse childhood experiences arising during the crisis. The bottom line is that if a child is hungry, living in cramped conditions, with limited access to education materials, whose parents have limited confidence or capacity to help them, then the longer lockdown goes on, the more severe the impact on their educational opportunity. This is not the fault of teachers or schools, as their response to this crisis has been truly amazing. But for decades we've been living in a world where competition, marketisation and privatisation have been the drivers of policy, and efficiency has been the goal. Children and parents have been treated as consumers. Delivering value for money has become the holy grail of public services. And people have been encouraged to look out only for themselves. What this has produced is widening inequality. What it has produced are fragile public services focused on increasingly narrow performance targets. What we have lost sight of is the social role of education, the value of community and the idea of the common good. And we have failed to support resilient institutions with the capacity to work with others to address and solve the complex, wicked problems that remain with us. And these problems and challenges affect every part of the education system. I consider myself lucky that I work in a university that's committed to making a positive impact on society. 
I consider myself lucky to work with teachers in Northern Ireland who, by their selfless dedication to the needs and interests of their pupils, have shown that the spirit of social solidarity remains alive and strong. All of these things give me hope, but we need to build on this hope to replace competition and selfishness with the spirit of compassion and cooperation. The world we build after the COVID-19 crisis cannot be the same as the one we have so recently left behind, mainly because the weaknesses and injustice of the old society have been laid bare by the crisis. Ken Robinson, noted educationalist and one of Queen's honorary graduates, recently asked whether we should look forward to restarting schools or resetting education. If we want to embrace the idea of education as a public good, working for the common good, in which every young person is given a fair opportunity, then a reset is really the only way forward.